So in terms, in terms of richness, they are exactly equal. In terms of abundance, they are exactly equal. The only thing that changes here is the evenness. Quite often, this is explored by using a, what we call a Whittaker plot. A Whittaker plot means taking all the species, all the species in order, in order of abundance, and representing the log of the abundance in this axis and the order of abundance in this other axis. And you can see quite clearly that this line here represents the completely, the completely even sample. This is maximal evenness. It's a flat line. On the other hand of the spectrum, a very step curve like this represents a completely dominated or almost completely dominated space in which one species gets it all and the rest of the species are up for crumbs only. Most natural uh, distributions will have a line with some kind of steepness. And another component which, is, which will be how long is this tail here of rare species. <coughs> this straight line here corresponds to exactly what? It's quite easy to, to see. If this is a log scale and this is a straight line, this is which distribution? This is the logarithmic distribution. Hmm? So, how do we measure this? How do we represent this curve? We use a diversity measurement. Recently, diversity was generalized into this formula, which has a distinct advantage. It's, it tends to measure what we call the true diversity. It's called also the Hill numbers. Uh, we don't need to get into the depth of the formula, but suffice, suffice, suffice to say that this pi here is the relative abundance of each species. So if one species has 10% of the individuals, its pi is exactly 0.1, 10%. If one species has 50% of all the individuals in the sample, then pi is 0.5. If the sample was composed by one single species, then pi would be 1, but this formula had, would, had, would make no sense. What's interesting here is that the true diversity can be measured in different ways by just changing these this component here, this coefficient, q. If this coefficient is q, then what we are looking at is the weighted harmonic of all the, all the uh, uh, individual components. And this is exactly richness. If this is zero, then this boils down to species, number of species, that's it. That's it. But if q is one, then we are looking at the geometric mean of the species abundances. And that equals to the exponent of Shannon's diversity. You know that you can use the Shannon's formula to calculate the number of species. That's the exponent of Shannon. Well, that's done by putting a 1 here. And if q is 2, then we are looking at the arithmetic mean. And that's the inverse of the Simpson index. The Simpson index is often confused with the dominance of Simpson. And the Simpson index is the complementary, there is one minus dominance, but it's a diversity index. It's a probabilistic diversity index. So the higher the order Q, what happens? The higher the Q, the more important the rare species are in our calculations. And the lower the Q, the less important the abundant ones are, or the rare ones one. In fact, if Q is zero, then basically we don't take into account the abundances at all. We simply deal with presence, absence data. There are here are some very commonly used diversity metrics. For instance, we have the total richness, which is S, which is what we see in the sample, something that we don't calculate, which we actually count. But we can calculate how many species are missing from our sample if we look at how, may, how many mis, uh, species are rare. I mean, how many ones 
we had in our distribution. That's what Anchao formalized in the expected species number, S X, which is the observed species number plus a square, which is the number of species represented by one single occurrences or one single occurrence or one single individual, divided by two B, where B are the number of species that are represented by two individuals. We have some very simple relationships. Oh, sorry, this is a mistake. <laughs> Forget about it. It's, it's not true. <laughs> I didn't realize that, sorry. Can I take this out? I must, uh, I must have been a completely last leap when I wrote that. <laughs> but um, richness in the case of Margalef is simply S minus 1 divided by the log of n, which uh, is the number of species, species minus 1 divided by the logarithm of n, which is simply a way Margalef was very upset that everybody after he published this in the context of a theoretical discussion started to use the R as an actual index. It is not an actual index, it's just an explanation of a concept. The explanation of this curve, in fact, or almost something like this curve, that there will be a lot of species eh, with many species, uh, sorry, a lot of species with few individuals and very few species with many individuals. That's a way to express this. But since it was so, such an easy formula, everybody started to use it much to Margalef chagrin. <coughs> I can erase this. <laughs> I will before I release the PDF, don't worry. <laughs> then we have the parametric distribution indexes. A distribution, an alpha series is basically a, a, a geometrical series in which alpha is calculated implicitly from this general term here in which alpha, the diversity of, of, of Fisher, it's just this parameter here within this equation that relates more or less like Margalev did, the number of species to the number of individuals. It's less and less used, although it has some advantages in certain contexts. Uh, but perhaps the most, by far the most widely used, used uh, diversity index are Richness, Simpson, and Shannon. And most likely you've been already published a number of papers using one of those three. But I doubt you, well, I don't doubt, but it's m less li very much, very much less li likely that you will have published something using R or alpha. Has any of you published something with R or alpha? No, but you have published something with H or, 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 or anything else. All right. <coughs> so, now let's, go, let's look at the components, alpha, beta, and gamma. What's alpha diversity? Well, alpha diversity is basically what we measure in one inventory or one data set. We have one inventory, one list, we essentially measure alpha diversity. This is probably the most agreed upon concept among ecologists. Most of them will agree what alpha means. Everything else they won't. But on alpha, they basically agree. We take one inventory, we measure alpha quite easily. We count the species, we calculate Shannon, whatever. So this is basically the species the diversity at the local or within site or within habitat in, in Whitaker's terms, terms um, scale. A small scale diversity. Or rather, in mathematical terms, a diversity that has no other components than classes and abundances. That's probably the most Mm. aseptic definition. Alpha can be measured over any sample size, in fact. The fact that it's local, it doesn't mean that it can only be measured over small samples. In fact, we could measure alpha over the entire planet if we wanted to. If we assume that the entire plan planet is one single biosphere or one single ecosystem. It's simply that we don't divide alpha into any components. Alpha is atomic. Well, physicists would absolutely bark at that. Atomic, atomic. There are subatomic particles, naturally. And it can be measured as long as you assume that there is no internal structure governing alpha other than, other than 
number of classes, number of individuals in each class. As such, if you have several samples, you could calculate a diversity for each sample and then get an average diversity for the average of the samples, which is slightly different from the average sample. I'll go into it later. But you don't pull that. So you have a data set and you can calculate an average diversity. But if you calculate the average for the entire combined data set, you're not calculating alpha. You're calculating something different. In fact, you're calculating gamma. And you will see that there are only always 20 species. And you could, if you wanted, use Excel quite easily to calculate diversity for each uh, uh, number, whichever measure you want. Uh, for instance, let's let's the, let's go here because it's it has more space here. <coughs> I'm going to count all non-zero values here. It gives me 92 species for sample A, and basically between 90 and 100 species that are present, that are not different from zero at each side, and the number of individuals, the total number of individuals is simply the sum of all this. So if we wanted to, let's say, calculate Margalef's richness, now that Margalef is dead, he will not, he will probably forgive me, <coughs> as <coughs> S minus one divided by log N, you get a function, which is a number which has no bounds, so it's not very easy to manage, uh, but similar, very similar in all cases. And if we want to, let's say, calculate uh, Simpson's diversity, <coughs> that is 1 minus d, we'll first need to, to get all the proportions somewhere. Let's do it. I'm showing that, well, this can be done manually, but naturally you can use a program to do this, which is much more efficient. But let's divide this by numbers which will give us the PI or proportions yeah. so I'm going to expand this until <coughs> J column here so I'm creating the proportion table Those are zeros, it's simply that they don't appear. <laughs> the so this is what we call PI. And then let's uh, shrink this so they don't get in the way. And now let's calculate the squares. What we do is simply calculate the square of each. This is not mathematically correct because I should multiply each number by each number minus one, but it will save us some time. Oops, mistake, wrong. This is the square of pi. And and the sum of all fears, I mean the sum of all this, is exactly the dominance of Simpson, 
which should be very low since they are those are those were random numbers. So we will have very little dominance, as you see here. And the complementary of this number is exactly the Simpsons index of diversity. So we have calculated Simpson index, and Shannon indexes would be quite easy to do by <coughs> using a third block, by multiplying this PI by its log, and well, you all you know all know all this, all right? So we have here diversities, a diversity measure for each of our original original sample. Okay, good. Let's go back to the presentation. Let's see if it works. Is it good? Okay. Normally you would do it not in Excel unless you want to explore some things, but you will probably use a prepackaged thing, such as, for instance, past. Mm? Uh, are you familiar with uh, diversity packages? Which packages are you using normally to calculate diversity? Do you use Excel or you use you always Excel, use Excel? Then do you remember it has it's taken us about five minutes to calculate a very simple index which is Simpson. With two more minutes we will have H. However, it's much easier if you simply do this. Again I have to to change this is it up? it is up, ok I'm going to take all the original numbers <coughs> copy them and anyway, I will put them in a package which is passed which you can download, or you might take it from this key here, which has a lot of downloads for you. <coughs> you can circulate this. There is a folder called BITC downloads that you can freely take. It has maps and papers and, and, and a distribution of R and past and a few other things. Okay, I'm going to copy everything here in a kind of spreadsheet like this. This is a very quick and dirty program. It's used for paleontology and it doesn't do many things, but some things that it, that it does, for very simple things, it does it very quickly. So I select all my samples and ask for diversity indices. And I got all of them, so it's much faster. The problem is that it only calculates a, a small number of indices. But normally what we need, here we have Margalefs, you see, remember it was 12 something. You have the number of, spe of the species, the number of individuals. It should coincide with Excel. If it doesn't, I did something wrong, very, very wrong. <laughs> and here's the dominance index that I calculate as a, pre uh, as a previous step to Simpson's indexes. It calculates H, which is very large. Why is it large? Because the worst of those were random numbers. So basically, uh, Shannon's, Shannon's index was near its maximum value, which is the log of S. Yeah? And Mehenic index, which is a, an index very similar to Margalef, it is uses a square word rather, rather than, than log. Uh, equitability, Fisher's alpha, uh, Berger package, <coughs> well, a series of indexes. You can do many or also other things. We'll use this package over the demonstration later too. All right, <coughs> let's go back to the presentation. So presentation is here, and I should probably rearrange. No, I don't need to rearrange anything. Good, great. <coughs> well, i am copied the uh, past results for this data set we saw here, and we can start examining a few things. As we saw <coughs> before, the number of species is 20, the number of individuals is 1,000, and one interesting thing you see here is that the Margalef number is exactly the same for completely different samples. Why is it so? It's quite easy to see. 
because it, Margalef doesn't take into account the structure. It's only the relationship between how many classes you have and how big was the original chunk. That's it. It doesn't take into account in how you divided this. This is also common to the mechanic index. I, I, just for the sake of space, I didn't put it here. And to Fisher's alpha. So they look at the relationship between size and classes, but not to the individual sizes. However, dominance is different. As you may see, as expected, this is a very low, low, low dominance, 0.05, which is as low as, low as it can get, actually. This is the, the lower bound for dominance with 20 species. And this is as, well, this is not as high as it can be, because the highest possible dominant would be everything, one individual, and everything else in that species. Right? But it's quite high. 0.6 is uh, an enormously uh, high dominance. You can think of dominance in terms of probability. Uh, suppose I have a bag like this. I don't know whose bag is this, but it doesn't matter. And suppose I have, suppose I have the, this bag full of ball of white balls. All right? So I put my hand in, and I take out a ball, and I know which color it will be. It will be white, naturally. OK, now, now suppose I have balls of two colors, black and white. Black means species black, white means species white. So I put my hand in and take one ball. Do I know which color it is? Mm, it could be black or white. It has 50% probability, all right? And uh, if there were 99 black balls and one white ball, most likely I'll take a black one. OK, now what happens if I take two balls, right? If I have only white balls, both will be white. If I have half black, half white, I take two balls. Simpson's dominance uh, uh, answers this question. What is the probability of both balls being the same color? Obviously, the, obviously this is lowest if you have half white, half black. But it is maximal if you have 99 black, one white. I take two balls, and most likely they will be both black. That's exactly what Simpson's dominance means, and that's exactly what the formula is. It's just a probabilistic formula, nothing else. <clears throat> OK. So alpha diversity is clear. Now what's gamma diversity? Formally. Gamma diversity is the diversity of the entire sampling universe, or the entire data set. But there is a more modern definition, which could be tautological in a sense. What is gamma diversity? Diversity that, that can be partitioned into alpha and beta components. I told you I was going to talk about diversity from the point of view of partitioning. You can partition gamma diversity into alpha and beta components, OK? So there's a geographical or classical formulation, which is the original one, the diversity at the landscape or other large scale level. As you see, there are several ways to look at gamma diversity. And ecologists tend to have their favorites. But there are also alternate concepts, much less used. It's very likely that you are not familiar with this concept. Gamma diversity is what Margalef called the time-persistent diversity. It has nothing to do with landscape diversity. It's a completely different idea. But the, it's simply that in the literature, it was published at, as gamma diversity. Uh, it can be done in several ways. For instance, uh, diversity that is contributed by only those species that persist in the ecosystems more than half-life of the of the typical species or other ways. We will not concern ourselves now with this concept or this definition of gamma diversity. We'll go up to more likely those concepts here. All right? Uh, again, I have to go back to my example data set. But I will say that gamma diversity is basically the total species diversity in a data set that contains subunits. So if your data set has more than one column, a gamma diversity can be calculated, and an alpha diversity can be calculated separately. 
If your data set has only one column, it doesn't matter. Alpha and gamma are the same thing. So, for example, in our data set of 100 species by 10 samples, you would, use, you would calculate gamma as summing all rows, and then calculate the diversity on that extra column. Whereas alpha is calculated at each column, and you can actually have an average alpha by averaging all those, all those diversities. But that, that would be different from gamma diversity. I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you now. How are we going in terms of time? All right, here I am. And I'll add a a column here that I will call total or gamma, by which I suppose I am assuming that all my samples were created equal in the sense that they were taken under the same protocol so they can be compared to each other uh, for, from similar areas or under similar efforts. This is a kind of a very debatable requirement, but let's suppose that I did it that way. So I had a total sample here, which is merely the total number of individuals of all species. So I can extend the calculations here. And it won't work unless <coughs> this one might be fake, because I haven't calculated the extra pi and the extra pi square. But those are correct, because those don't depend on anything but this. The number of the species is 100, that's the total number of species. The number of individuals in the entire data set was 24,000. And R is just the relationship be between those two numbers. But Simpson's diversity might or might not be correct. Let's have a look. Here you ha I'm going to put the PIs for, or the relative proportions for the final column. And therefore, if I add also an extra column here, I will have the pi square, which I need for Simpson. And naturally, it's sum. Now I have a lower dominance, but not as low as some, or perhaps a little bit higher than some others. It's 0 0.01. So the actual Simpson's diversity oop, Where did I put? The, I did something wrong here. Let me have a look. Oh, I was missing, sorry, I was missing one column before. <coughs> I will fix it now. Now. That's okay now. And, uh, all right. This is the final Simpson formulation, which is a number which must be different from each other. And this is the gamma diversity of the data set. Okay? Now, this is gamma. But what is the average alpha? We simply average the edges of each diversity. And this is only one or of two ways to do that, because we can actually also bootstrap the entire data set and get the diversity of that bootstrap sample. We can do it a number of times, say 1,000 times, and get an average of those boosted, boost, boot, 
bootstrap samples, and that's a different measure too, which has the advantage that you can use also, uh, you can calculate confidence intervals for that. So now let's look at this column. And let's say that the total diversity of the data set is 100 species, 9.7 richness, and 0 0.989 Simpson. But the average diversity in your data set, the average diversity of one given sample, is much more in terms of Margalef, 12, which is closer to those numbers here, than average number of species of your data set is 97, not 100. And the average Simpson is 0 0.986, which is lower. Not much, but lower, right? Good. Let's change this now, this simulation slightly, and uh, let me substitute this by adding many more zeros, okay? I'm going to put uh, about twice as many zeros as before. Twice or three times, I don't, I'm not sure. Remember, this is a simulation. So now you see the number of species has been, is lower now, per sample. The average is also lower. We go down from 97 to 95, <coughs> but the total gamma remains the same, 100. Okay, let's again increase the number of zeros. I'm simply removing the maximum, the, max, the upper bound. And see, we still have 100 species, gamma diversity, but our average alpha diversity is 191 now in terms of species. Okay. Let's go back to the presentation.